on 21 weeks today and we are super excited and we're having an ultrasound day. Hi. Come on in. Is this your first ultrasound? Um, no, we had one around nine weeks. Well, we could look at everything today. Baby's been moving good? Yes, a lot of movement. Let's see what's going on today. This will be warm. Okay. There's your baby's heart today. That looks good. The head's up here. You can see the little face, little profile. There's the spine. It looks like there's a little bit of a problem down here in the spine. We probably need to send you to a specialist so that we can rule out spina bifida. We've been there. I've been there. We've all been there. We all have a child with spina bifida, and we've come together to give you support and advice. We understand the emotions you're feeling right now. We know that you are probably talking with a lot of doctors and other medical professionals about spina bifida. And you're likely reading information online about the birth defect. All that information is important, but it can be very overwhelming. This video will give you advice, support, and encouragement from families who know exactly what you're going through. Here's our story. On December 26, 2001, the Mayberry family of three became the Mayberry family of four with the addition of Katie Faith Marie Mayberry. We knew at 19 weeks of my pregnancy that Katie would be born with spina bifida, a condition that prevents the spinal cord from forming properly in the womb during the first 28 days of a pregnancy. When she was born, there was a lesion on her back about the size of an orange. It looked like raw flesh down to her spinal cord. The severity of the complications can vary from patient to patient, but usually involves some degree of paralysis and poor bladder and bowel control. She was immediately taken to Arkansas Children's Hospital and at one day old had her first surgery to repair her spinal cord. She had to lay on her belly for six weeks while the stitches healed. Almost a week later, we got to hold her for the first time. So how does it feel, Dad? She had one more surgery before her departure from Children's Hospital. Part of Katie's brain is sunken into her neck, forcing the fluid that should flow freely from her head to other parts of her body to back up. A tube called a shunt was placed in her head to drain that fluid into her belly. The first year of Katie's life was full of ups and downs. She learned to roll over at nine months. Roll over. Yeah, push. <gasps> She later began to scoot around the house by army crawling and eventually learned to sit up. At slightly over two years old, Katie got wheels. What are you in, Katie? Wheelchair. She learned very quickly how to maneuver the wheelchair around objects. She loves being able to get around without having to use all of her energy to crawl or to cry for mom or dad to pick her up. At about two weeks after the wheelchair, Katie stood for the first time with the help of braces. I stand at the table. You are standing at the table. I look so cute. I look so cute. I look so cute. She is even beginning to take the smallest of steps. One small step for man, one gigantic step for Katie. Ready, set, go. Go, there you go. You did a good job. I will walk out of this. 
I used to look at a child in a wheelchair or braces and think, oh, poor thing. With Katie, all I see is pride, determination, and a twinkle in her eyes. I'm eight years old and I have two other sisters. They love me and I love them. Throughout her life, there has been no activity that Katie has wanted to do that she hasn't been able to do in some way. Sometimes we have to find a different way, but she can do it. Just like so many other children with spina bifida, look what they can do. What do you see when you look at me? Am I strange? I'm not the same. You think that I'm different by what you see. I wish you'd look closer. Take a look at
As parents of a child with spina bifida, we understand that it's hard to see all the positives right now. But keep in mind, we've all gotten the same news you have, and we remember those emotions. My reaction when I found out that Wednesday was going to have spina bifida was scared at first, then um, you kind of go through five different emotions. I went through my anger, my depression, my loss, because you feel a sense of loss. And But they told us that he would die because his level of spina bifida was so bad that he would, he would probably live a few days. That was it. And we would, and so we went home. I mean, they let us cry it out. We all cried. My husband and I, we both cried. And then we went home, and we was just preparing ourselves because we had two months. I was seven months when I found out, and I had two months, and I went two months thinking that he would die, and he didn't. It proves that you know sometimes they're wrong, and they can be active. As president of the Spina Bifida Support Group of Arkansas, when I get telephone calls and I return them. Uh, I tell them that congratulations that you're having a baby and the parent there's silence on the other end and she'll say oh and I say yeah I said having spina bifida is, is a journey it's it's a lifelong journey that will be happy to help you along the way and uh, she starts sometimes crying and that uh, we uh, talk and I answer questions and she asks questions and uh, it's really nice. By the end, she knows a little bit more about spina bifida and what to expect, and knows that everything's going to be all right. When we found out that he had spina bifida, I was kind of upset, wondering, you know, what I did wrong that caused it, you know, if there's, you know, any medicine or something, you know, that I could have taken or um, lifting too much at work, trying to put it on myself, you know, that it was my fault, but they, you know, we hear that, you know, it doesn't, spina bifida doesn't have to run in the family in order for, you know, your kid to come down with it. I can remember one situation where a family called us and our counselor set the um, mom up to talk with someone who had a child with spina bifida and the mom said, my goodness, she said, I thought we were going to have a birth and then have a funeral and you've told me that we're going to have a life. Mm -hmm. And so it really made a big, big difference to that family. Before Leighton was born, yeah, I mean, there's a, there was a lot of uncertainty, a lot of unknown, and yeah, there, it really was. You know, I came from an athletic family and, you know, and I didn't know about like wheelchair basketball, which he enjoys. And, I, you know, I honestly, I thought about stuff like that. What is he, you know, what is he going to be able to do physically and and uh, everything like that? I thought it was something that could be fixed, and it wasn't. And I went we went to a specialist, and by being a construction, he said, "What kind of what's your profession?" I said, "Electrician." He said, "Well, I explain it to you like this: It's like putting a truss on a house, and this part of the house didn't get the trusses on it, and it made sense." I uh, didn't have any background information about spina bifida whatsoever. Uh, that pretty much came, you know, later on after he was born. I uh, just went in, um, they did the delivery and immediately took him over to Children's Hospital to do the shunt placement and to close the spine. So uh, it, it was just like, you know, it was, it was a bombardment pretty much. Like I said, I didn't have much time to get any background information about it. So. I got to see him first on a Saturday, and of course I was really nervous, and we went through uh, the, the neonatal ICU, and I was just, every baby I saw, I was hoping it was him because they all looked so good, you know? And when I got to him, he really was banged up. He had had all kinds of surgeries, and, um, and he um, had not opened his eyes yet. And I sat down in a chair and um, started to talk to him, and he opened his eyes. Sorry. And it was just, it was great. The more information that you know about spina bifida, the better. Talk to parents, look on the internet, talk to adults with spina bifida. You'll find a wealth of information just with them. And make sure that you listen to what your doctor has to say. Ex let him explain it to you. And if it doesn't sound right, or if you don't agree with it, then change it. 
you know, don't just take the first opinion that you hear. Make sure you understand what they're asking you to do with your child or what they're asking to do to your child and make sure it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense, go somewhere else. When he was born and in the hospital, you, yeah, you feel down, you feel hurt, and you always ask the question, why me? And I've told this story a few times, but we was at the children's hospital and I was on the second floor intending to leave out. And I went on the elevator and came out on the ground floor. And when I went outside, there were a family out there crying because they had lost their child. And then reality sunk in, you're going to take a child home. They're not. So just be thankful for having a child to carry home. And like I said, it's a challenge. But without challenges, you wouldn't have champions. You need to teach your child and it, just like you would a regular, regular kid. Give them chores. Make sure you promote independence. Don't let them say, I can't do it. You know, make sure they try everything, just like you would a normal kid. Put them out there. If they want to do it, don't try to stop them. Because I have put roller skates on Noah, and everyone is saying, you know, and I've let him do whatever he thinks he can do. And if they say, I want to do it, Mom, he does it. Unless, I, you know, I, I haven't found anything that, I've just told him, no, you cannot, you cannot do that because if they want to do it and they want to try doing it, there's a good possibility they're going to be able to do it. Uh, even if you're in a wheelchair, you can still do anything that anybody else can do, even play basketball. As a parent, you got to be a little bit more harder on a child that has these uh, disabilities or, or handicaps because you got to make him realize that he can do whatever he needs to do. And when he say he can't, he said, yes, you can. It's, it's a hard lesson to learn, but in life, as they grow older, they'll appreciate it. He just makes everything better. Um, and I, I so, so just say that from a, a, a parent standpoint. People tell us that all the time. Um, from the time he was born until the, now that he's 13, he's just really, um, he's positive. Um, he's good to all people. He brings out the best in everybody. It's amazing. Some people, especially when I was younger, and even now I've gotten that before, they come up to her, and I'm right next to her, and they ask her, oh, what's her name? How old is she? Why is she in a wheelchair? Um, what's wrong with her? And I'm like, I'm right here. Why don't you ask me? And I get that a lot. But I think someone that doesn't accept you if, because you're in a wheelchair, they're not worth it. There's a lot of stereotypes that are connected with disability, much less a wheelchair. And, and I had all those same ideas about a wheelchair that a lot of people do. But I am at a point now in my life where I believe walking is overrated. And I have actually had more independence using a wheelchair uh, than I did when I was able to walk. The nice thing about walking is that you're at the same eye level with everybody else, but I couldn't even walk one block to school. And yet, um, in my wheelchair, I became a world record holder in a 26.2 mile race. It just created a, a freedom and independence that I didn't know was missing. And he used the same language that we use. Like he'll say, I'm gonna run over here. Uh, I'm going to walk over here and do this. Same language. He doesn't say anything about a wheelchair. He jumped rope and everything. He's, just a, he's a normal kid. He's just in a wheelchair. When I go into a room, everybody just comes around me, and they just they just talk to me and everything, and they think I'm cool, and they think I have a cool wheelchair. Just take everything one day at a time. And, and just wait and take it when it comes. Not Don't try to plan for all the things that's going to happen later. You know, take it, what's happening today, deal with that today, because if you don't, you'll get overloaded. I do go to the doctors a lot. I do have to have a lot of surgeries, but you can't let that be your life. You have a life, and I love to do things. That I have lots of friends, and I like to do things with them. And I like to do things, I mean, doctors isn't my life. And to get over surgery, you just think about those things and then think about you want to do that when you're better. You know, like he's had several surgeries. And, you know, to, to be strong through something like that, 
we've had to depend on God. Everybody expects their kids to be born healthy, but it also is a gift from God. You've got to understand that it's a gift from God. These are special children and that we should always be proud of it. And I wouldn't trade him for two healthy children because you can learn something from them all the time. We were in the process of putting this video together when we met Jesse and Jody McGinley. They were expecting twins, Walker and Eli. Eli was going to be born with spina bifida, and we were going to videotape his birth for this project. The outcome, though, was not what we expected. We went in for our 20-week ultrasound. We knew we were expecting twins, and we had our families there, our parents, uh, both sets of our parents, and they said, it's a boy, it's a boy, and so we're chatting, having a good time, and, uh, and Dr. Wendell came in, and there was an obvious problem that uh, he, he detected on the ultrasound, said that uh, baby A had a neural tube defect. No parent and no family wants that diagnosis. You know, we're, we're all part of a, a group, uh, a club of parents that no parent wants to be a part of. But in the end, your child's coming. Your child is uh, going to rely on you. And, you know, you, you want to do everything possible to love that child, to make that child feel comfortable. And I, I truly, truly believe that the, the Lord knows what he's doing. He knows where to place these children. Mm -hmm. Eli was born first. Mm -hmm. It was, it was surreal. It was scary, and uh, but we were ready. When he come out, he I didn't hear anything. He, you kind of tell he wasn't breathing, and I seen his back, and you could tell that it was worse than what anybody ever met, or what I envisioned it looking like. Without using all the, the big medical terms, and um, Eli had a uh, a cyst on his brain stem, and the neurosurgeon said that that would cause him to be on a, a trach for the rest of his life. He would never be able to breathe on his own, and um, he also had a, a very severe case of hydrocephalus, which is also a part of spina bifida, of course. But he also had uh, some of his brain that was being pushed out of the skull and it was kind of growing on the outside of the skull. But re the MRI results did determine that that was brain that was coming down. So um, they told us that he had been di diagnosed with uh, multiple anomalies um, on top of the spina bifida. Our hearts sunk. And so that's when we had to, we made the decision to go ahead and pull the vent the next day. So. Mm -hmm. That was tough. That was tough. Um. And initially, he kind he he kind of turned purple, and we thought it was it was done. And of course, he started, ended up living 31 hours on his own. Yeah. I think he wanted to go see his brother. <laughs> the the boys were separated at you know hospitals. Walker was at UAMS in the the NICU, and of course Eli was taken to Children's immediately after the birth. Some ways through the, those 31 hours, the, the doctors at both hospitals were really urging us to, to make the decision to, to put them together. I mean, he was obviously holding on to something, and uh, we had so many more hours with him than, than we had ever, ever hoped for. A lot more time to hold him, to talk to him, and we got pictures of the two together. It was, it was a blessing. It was absolutely a blessing. Mm -hmm. I think he's accomplished more in five days than me and Jody ever have our whole lives. I mean, he's mm -hmm. touched so many people and just even just done so many things with just him being here. That is, you know, we we got so much more closure by carrying on with that pregnancy. And of course, like Jesse said, there is hope. You don't know. Babies are miracles, regardless. And. Uh, we had so much more time with Eli than what doctors had told us, and, and that's a miracle in itself, but even if the child's not predicted to live, that's your baby, and I think parents would be making the, the wrong decision if they didn't give that baby a chance. He was, since he was so small, all he could 
donate, uh, as far as organs is concerned, was his heart valves. Mm -hmm. And there was two that he could donate, so he could possibly save two lives. We're still awaiting uh, the papers. And I mean, we eventually may one day get to meet two babies or two children that uh, has been touched by Eli. So. I just hope um, other families make the choice to not terminate these births and um, these children are so special. They're just so special, such a blessing. From a mother of a special needs child to another mother of a special needs child, you will always be their mother and they deserve you and you deserve them. And the love that you will have for that child is just the same as it would be for a healthy child, um, or any child of that matter. And that child was created uh, by God and was sent to you. And I am a, I'm a true believer that uh, the Lord would not have handed you that if he didn't think that you were the one that would be able to, to take care of it.